Uh, this Lunch and Learn is a little out of sequence. We usually have about once a month, but we had an opportunity today to have Kevin Fickinger, who's the, the new CEO and president of the American Medical Informatics Association, uh, come to campus. And I thought, since he was going to be here anyway, it might be a nice idea if uh, he could give a talk to the group. Um, and um, so Kevin just joined AMIA in the last two months. Uh, he hails from Perot Systems and CSC and uh, had been a clinician prior to that in uh, North Dakota and had done some early pioneering work in telemedicine. Um, he's going to talk to us about where the where healthcare informatics is going in the next, uh, I guess, the next 10 years or so. And hopefully he'll uh, give us uh, some good insights about that. And this is going to be Mark Wiener, who's going to join us for lunch as well. So Kevin, let me uh, hand this off to you and go find our wayward recruit. Okay. Hey, Mark. pleasure to be here today and to have the opportunity to talk with you and to share some uh, thoughts and perspectives on healthcare uh, and informatics and <clears throat> the role of informatics in the future of healthcare. Uh, I thought what I would do is, I'm not a technical guy, so I'm a, I'm a business person. I've been on the business side for a long time. I have a very deep appreciation uh, for informatics and what it can do, but I'm not like many of you. I'm not, I'm not a smart so, uh, but I know how to use these tools to make a difference in healthcare. And so, what I wanted to do today is to talk with you about what I see happening in the healthcare industry in the United States, and specifically where I think things are going, because we are experiencing a tremendous amount of change. <clears throat> I think we're at a very, very significant inflection point, one that we haven't seen for 40, 50 years in the healthcare industry. So I wanted to talk with you about that because at the end of the day, from my perspective, informatics is at the core of how we're going to solve some of these problems. So with that, I'm going to jump into it. This is my metaphor for what's going on in healthcare. And as you all probably know, this is a very famous Japanese painting <coughs> of a tsunami wave. Now, a lot of people didn't know what a tsunami wave was until about, I think it was three, four years ago <coughs> on Christmas Eve when that <coughs> massive wave came ashore in Southeast Asia and we turned on CNN and we saw this wave causing destruction of everything in its path. Well, tsunamis are, you know, they occur and they occur as a result of a disruption that occurs in the surface of the earth. What's interesting about a tsunami is that when you're out in the middle of the ocean, <coughs> it dissipates into the depths of the ocean. You don't feel it. So you don't even know it when it goes by. It's basically only when it gets to shore where it's a sound wave and it creates a massive wave, a massive wave of destruction that cannot be stopped. You cannot build brick walls high enough. You cannot plant enough trees. Tsunamis will wipe everything out in their path, just like we saw in Japan this last year. So <clears throat> why is that my metaphor? Well, what's interesting about a tsunami is that the destruction is separated by time and distance from the origination where the tsunami came from. And I think that's what's going on in healthcare. I think we have a bunch of tsunamis going on. I think there's a bunch of things <coughs> that started to occur about a decade ago uh, throughout the world that are causing tsunami waves, and healthcare is the target for many of these uh, changes that have occurred in society in general. So <coughs> this is the Chinese anagram uh, for the word <coughs> tsunami. And uh, so you'll see this anagram periodically on my slides as we go through it. Uh, <clears throat> Jonathan Swift in 1711 said, vision is the art of seeing things invisible. Vision is the art of seeing things invisible. Uh, Charles Duell, 1899, everything that can be invented has been invented. Vision is the art of seeing things invisible. Harry Warner, 1927, who the hell wants to hear actors talk anyway? <laughs> vision. Uh, one of my favorites is uh, 640K ought to be enough yeah. for anybody. <laughs> we all know who said that. Vision is the art of seeing things invisible. So <clears throat> what I'd like to do today is share some of my vision, if not hallucinations, uh, uh, about what I think is going to be going on 
uh, in healthcare. One of the fundamental problems that I feel is occurring in the healthcare industry today is that uh, we are not looking for uh, new we're not looking at the lands with new territory. I think that's a real core issue. So that we have uh, physicians who are sort of looking at the healthcare world from their perspective. We have nurses looking at it from their perspective. We have pharmaceutical companies looking at it from their perspective. We've got healthcare systems looking at it from yet another perspective. We've got consumers who have their perspective. And we're all sort of got our blinders on. And what's interesting about it is that some of the creativity that's occurring in the industry is where people are taking off their blinders. And they're saying, hey, let's look at this new. Let's look at this different. So we have a lot of entrance into the healthcare system who are coming at it with a whole new perspective, a whole new uh, idea on how we uh, can make change happen. Now, I wanted to ask this question uh, for all of you. So uh, which individual in the last decade, or the last century, uh, helped the U.S. save the most money in health care costs? Who? Kevorkian. <laughs> Good. Interesting answer. I've never, never heard that one. I've never heard that one. Yeah, we're not cynical here at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Anybody else besides that? Any other, any other thoughts? John Salk. John Salk. I've heard that a lot. As a matter of fact, that, actually, that's pretty close. But it was, uh, a lot of people actually think that it was this guy, Sierra Coop, because he's the one who took uh, Luther Terry's report, the Surgeon General's report on smoking, and he's the one that took the bully pulpit and said, let's stop smoking. And smoking went from 43% of the population down to roughly 20% today. Now, that's, that, that is a huge impact, but it's not him. It's not him. It's him. I think I was Elvis. Elvis Presley. Yeah. Elvis Presley. Yeah. Oh, come on, Kevin. Elvis Presley. What are you talking about? Well, what's interesting, and actually the person who talked about Salk is, is very close, is uh, do you know what happened on October the 28th, 1956? Anybody around then besides me? <laughs> well, what happened is that Elvis Presley went on a simulcast on ABC, CBS, and NBC. And he had his immunization done for polio by Jonas Salk. The immunization rate in the United States went from 0.6% to 93% in the next year. Now, that's impressive that it went that high, but what's even more impressive is that it changed the entire attitude of the American public about immunizations. All of a sudden, we were getting our measles, mumps, and rubella vaccinations. We were getting flu vaccinations. It changed the whole notion of how we treat ourselves as, a, as, a, as consumers and how we treat our kids. So, you know, should we be looking for Elvis? Uh, I used to live in Kalamazoo, and he's not there. <laughs> I'll tell you that. I'll tell you that. But, uh, you know, I, I think uh, what's interesting is that we frequently in our industry talk about trying to find, you know, the icons that can help move the industry. So, you know, there's been a lot of buzz around Jamie Oliver and what he's trying to do around diets and, you know, get kids uh, getting their weight under control and stuff. That's, that's good. That's, that's all good stuff. But I think the answer is actually us. You know what's fascinating is when I go around and talk to healthcare people, we know what to do. We know how to make the healthcare system better. We know how to make it more efficient. We know how to make it more effective, but we're not doing it. And I think we need to step off the plate. So it's not really about Elvis, it's about us. And that's one of my core messages that I wanted to share with you. Uh, over the last uh, couple of decades, I've had a lot of interesting experiences. And one of the most interesting is when I worked in uh, international, I was responsible for international health care for Perot Systems. I lived in London. And I basically had the opportunity to travel around the world. And <clears throat> one of the things that really hit me during that uh, two-year stint is that the issues around the world are basically the same as they are here. That healthcare focuses on three things. It focuses on cost. And people like low cost for their healthcare services. Actually, they like it free if they can get it. But, you know, low cost is good. High cost doesn't work for a lot of people. Particularly as we are increasingly asking people to reach into their own pockets and come up with their own dollars to pay for their services, which is increasingly what we, what we are doing as a society, consumers are suddenly getting very interested in the cost of health care. Second thing that they're interested in is they want quality. Actually, they don't want quality. They want perfect health care. 
Does anybody want to volunteer and be admitted to the local hospital here for a, a nosocomial infection this afternoon? Anybody want to volunteer for that? Okay. So they want perfect health care. And we were just talking about that in terms of uh, pharmaceuticals. The expectation is that the drugs will be perfect every time and there will be no side effects. Well, that's, you know, that's not realistic. Uh, everything in life has a risk. And finally, they, they, they want service. They, they, uh, and they want it right, right now. And that's because in the rest of their life, they can get those kinds of activities right now. So they want better service. So those are the three things that I think are really dominating discussions uh, in healthcare. And if we paid attention to those three things, we could solve a lot of problems. The other issue is that we're moving from an information theocracy. Hi, I'm Dr. Fickenshire. I, I went to medical school. I'm really smart. I did really well. Um, and I'm you know, a graduate, and I went to a nice residency and all that kind of stuff. And you know, here's my prescription, and you know, trust me. To an information democracy. Uh, Dr. Frickinger, I looked you up on the web last night. I discovered that you're in the bottom quartile of the class of uh, 1973 at the University of North Dakota. Uh, you did pretty well in your residency, but according to these reports, uh, your, your standard of care is in the bottom quartile. So would you explain, Dr. Frickinger, why I should let you touch me? That's information democracy. Information democracy is where people come in and they ask their oncologist, why aren't you following the protocol that they're using for prostate cancer that they're using at MD Anderson? Why, I mean, you know, how come you're not doing that? And the doc has to have an answer. So <clears throat> that is clearly changing the power paradigm of, of healthcare. We are moving from uh, the theocracy to the democracy. And I think that's a very important shift that is going to have dramatic impact on healthcare. <coughs> Uh, and that means that the information that we share the, and how we share the information is becoming increasingly important. Some of the forces, so I'm, I'm talking about all these tsunami waves that are, that are sort of splashing on the shore. Uh, we're also seeing consolidation. <clears throat> you have gone through consolidation <coughs> in the pharmaceutical industry over the last couple of decades. Uh, it's beginning to affect other parts of the industry as well. We're seeing massive consolidation in the hospital sector. Uh, the number of discussions that are going on between multi-billion dollar healthcare systems where they're coming together to create even larger healthcare systems is really uh, amazing. I was just at a meeting with some of my colleagues. We've been working together for 20 years. Many of them are CEOs and COOs of healthcare systems. Uh, and they are involved in any number of merger and acquisition type discussions. Uh, so consolidation in the hospital sector is occurring. It's occurring in the physician sector. As a matter of fact, Physicians are clamoring to try to figure out who they should work with because they recognize that if they don't do that, that they may be left out in the cold in terms of as we move into these new uh, paradigms of how we're going to be delivering care. Uh, we're also seeing the breakdown of traditional boundaries. Did anybody predict that uh, Walmart was going to get into the healthcare business? Did anybody pick that one up before it actually occurred? Yeah, most of us missed that one coming. Um, I actually, about 15 years ago, 20 years ago, used to go, get up and give a talk where I introduced myself as the senior vice president of Sears and that we were starting a healthcare unit we were going to take out the carpet section of our Sears stores and we were going to put in clinics and we were going to have, actually use nurse practitioners and we were going to give the, the consumers beepers and let them go out in the store because we figured out that they would buy $43.16 worth of goods before they came back to the clinic and we were always going to have them be about 10-15 minutes late. Now, what's interesting is that that's kind of what Walmart is doing, and it's really fascinating, you know, uh, for, you know, $49.95. <coughs> so we've got new entrants. Uh, we've got cross-industry convergence, where the hospitals and the physicians are coming together, where we've got insurance companies buying up healthcare systems. So we're seeing that beginning to occur. <coughs> Clearly the rising tide of technology, and then finally, workforce globalization. I got on a plane <coughs> about uh, two years ago, and uh, usually when I get on planes, because I travel a lot, I usually have this little thing I do, which is I sit on the aisle, first of all, and then I lean towards the aisle, and then I cross my leg towards the aisle, and I give a very clear message of, don't talk to me. Well, on this particular day, I became Dr. Chatty, and I started talking to the guy, and I discovered he was a physician. I said, oh, I'm a physician, too, you know. We were in San Francisco flying to Washington, D.C., and I said, what are, you, what are you doing in Washington? He says, I'm not going to Washington. I said, oh, really? Uh, where are you headed? He says, oh, I'm going to Paris. I said, ah, oh, Paris. I love Paris. Great place. 
What are you going to do in Paris? He says, well, I work there. I said, well, I thought you just told me you worked in San Francisco. He said, well, I do. Uh, what I do is I'm a radiologist and I provide radiology services for my partners back in San Francisco from Paris. And then I asked him if I could get a job. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and that, that was two years ago. That was pretty uncommon. But today, that's not uncommon at all. Matter of fact, I know of one medical school where the radiology department closes down at 5 o'clock and is taken over by a radiology organization out of India. And they have a partnership going for reading uh, standard films. Uh, laboratory, anything that's digital can be moved any place. We all know that. And that is changing our whole notion of how we're going to deliver services. So the forces that we see are, first of all, the global economy, which is a huge factor. The fact that the nation's budgets are being stretched. Um, you know, the, the big issue in the United States is that we have this budget crisis. Uh, the biggest part of the budget that uh, is being debated is health care because it is such a fast-growing piece of the budget that doesn't seem to be able to be controlled. That's the reason it's getting so much attention by at Capitol Hill. Um, we've got the, the boomers. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm 62 years old. Uh, in the last two years, I have consumed more health care services than I consumed in the previous 60 years of life. I'm a fairly typical boomer. That's what boomers do. We consume resources, and we want it right now, by the way. And we want it our way. So we're pretty demanding. And there's a whole bunch of us. So not only has the healthcare system got an issue, but it's got a whole cadre of folks that are going to stress the system even more than it's already stressed. The other issue that we have is that, I don't know if you know this or not, but the average age of nurses in the United States is 55. Another issue that's uh, important is that physicians are, over the next 10 years, we're going to see upwards of a third of the physician workforce in the United States either become disabled, die, or retire. One third over the next decade to 12, 15 years. That's a huge number of providers that we have potential for losing. My contention is, if we think we're going to deliver care with the same old delivery model that we developed 50 years ago, I, I think we're wrong. So I think we need to be thinking very clearly about what is our delivery model and where is it going to go. When I went to medical school uh, genomics, we had um, a one-week course. That's all we had. And it was, I think, only two hours a day. So, you know, and you couldn't get by with uh, you know, 10 hours of genomics in today's world. Uh, finally, the internet, and then <clears throat> finally the consumerism issue. And one of the things I think that healthcare is beginning to figure out, but hasn't really figured out yet, is that there is a big difference between Ruth Chris and McDonald's. There is a difference between a Chevy and a Lexus, and consumers understand that. And yet we try to treat everything the same, and uh, that's an issue. This is a slide, actually, that I've been using for 20 years. I update it every year. And what it shows is the percentage of uh, investment by a country as a percent of GDP in healthcare versus the um, uh, per capita income uh, for uh, individuals in that country. And what you see is it roughly falls along the line. So as, as the per capita income goes up, societies spend more money on healthcare. There, is, there are two countries that sort of dramatically increase theirs. That's the UK where uh, several years ago, when Tony Blair was prime minister, they increased the payment uh, to primary care physicians, and so the cost of the NHS went up pretty dramatically. And then we have the United States, which is you know, way above the curve. And going north, that's, that says at 18%, we're actually <clears throat> around 19% now going to 20 The question is, if we do that, um, what are we going to take out? There's only so much money, so are we going to have holes in the road? Are we going to get rid of uh, certain programs in schools? That's what they did in California. They decided to get rid of second languages. That's a really smart thing to do in a global economy, not teach your kids something besides English. Um, so, you know, <clears throat> we've got all these choices that we have to make, and so as we consume more resources in healthcare, that, that is creating problems for society. This is a very interesting slide that I just put together about a month ago, and it shows the um, up and down of the percent of uh, debt to GDP ratio. And you can see that after World War II, the debt to GDP ratio went up quite high, but then over the ensuing decades, we paid off the debt 
up until recently, in 2010, where it got to 98 percent, and it's projected to go to 115 percent by 2020 if we don't do something. Now, what's the red line? The red line is Greece and Spain. So the question is, do we think that, uh, that we're going to allow the United States to get into the same kind of situation? Now, granted, the United States is different than Greece and Spain. We do have a lot of resources, but, you know, I guess I ask the question, maybe we should solve this problem. Maybe we should solve this problem. And by the way, it's interesting, I, I just had a briefing on, on the politicians. You know, it's really interesting about Washington, D.C., that the two sides really are at a point. It used to be they worked together. I mean, I remember working with, you know, Dave Durenberger, who was a Republican from Minnesota, and Bob Dole, Republican from Kansas, and Senator Burdick, a Democrat from North Dakota, and uh, a bunch of other Democrats, and we got into a room and we solved problems, you know, around rural health issues. And it was really, it was good to see that happen. Today, you couldn't get the people in the same room. I mean, there's really a lot of acrimony and a lot of animosity that is involved, which is really tragic, I think, for the country. Uh, but that's my political editorial. I'll stop there. Um, so what's the anticipation? What I want to do now is start, I think I've made the point that we've got a problem. So the issue is, okay, so how are we going to solve the problem? We're not going to solve the politics, but I think we can do things in the field. We can make changes. We can drive better care delivery. And I think it's built around these six areas. So let me talk about each one. First of all, it, it's very clear to me that we do need to think about how we can use a global workforce to help solve some of the problems in healthcare. Healthcare delivery. Uh, much of the information is digital. I know that as a, a global company, that you're working together virtually across all sorts of boundaries, uh, and that's good. I think that's an example of what we need to be thinking about because it's a much more efficient model, and it actually can com compound our results. Uh, this is the slide that I was talking to you about in terms of the shortage of physicians. So uh, you know we're going to be short by 2025 about 70,000 uh, non-primary care physicians, shortage uh, of all physicians, about 130,000. That's, that's pretty significant. Now, there's a lot of issues uh, why that's occurring. It's not just a shortage of providers. It's also a change in the attitude of, of physicians. They don't, I mean, my era, we worked uh, 70, 80 hours a week. Physicians don't like to do that anymore. So they, they like lifestyle. And as a matter of fact, the interesting thing about the specialties is that the specialties that have no problem in recruiting residents are the lifestyle specialties. It's the primary care that have uh, had more difficulty in attracting. So I think this is a core issue. Knowledge diffusion. Um, oh, th th what this is, is um, I, anybody know Larry Downs? Uh, he's a sort of an economist type, uh, technology economist, uh, who's at uh, UC Berkeley. And he had an article uh, about uh, 12 years ago in the Industry Standard uh, about what he called the, the technology healthcare or technology uh, cost curve. And I looked at it and I went, wow, this is really healthcare as well. And basically what it says is that if you have price over here and you have volume over here, that if you have a low volume or if you have unique knowledge, you can kind of charge anything you want. And that's exactly what happens in our healthcare system. Uh, some of the ultra specialists, uh, they can charge anything they want. They can charge cash. I was talking with a uh, dermatologist. I had dinner with him the other night who's a hair transplant guy. And he doesn't see you unless you pay him cash. Not, not checks, cash. Because he lives in Canada. And he comes to the United States to practice. Um, interesting. Interesting model, right? Now, I'm a family physician. If patients walk into my office, can I demand cash for my services? No, they're going to say, Kevin, I'm going to go next door. You know, I'm not going to do that. So that's because I have general knowledge. I have knowledge that is held by lots of people. As a matter of fact, the data shows pretty clearly that a nurse practitioner can do 93% of what I do. And so the question becomes, uh, you know, who should I go see? Um, what's interesting about healthcare <clears throat> is that we tend to treat all problems the same. 
But in fact, there, you know, if I had a glioblastoma, if I were to suddenly fall over and have a seizure, I'd want to go find the glioblastoma specialist. I mean, because I'm a physician, I would probably go out and try to do that. Versus if I'm a 32-year-old mother of three children and I've had my fourth UTI in the last year, am I going to want to go sit and wait in Dr. Fickenshire's office for three, four hours waiting for him to show up so I can get my antibiotics and go home and go back to work? I don't think so. So the issue here is that these are services and these are products. And that's what Walmart has figured out. Not only Walmart, but we've got a bunch of other organizations that have figured it out as well. And they're beginning to provide product services. They're disintermediating the healthcare system as we've known it. Now, I don't think that's bad necessarily. I actually think they do really good work. They actually have very high quality outcomes. It, as a matter of fact, it would not surprise me if <laughs> McDonald's decided to get into the cardiovascular business. <laughs> <laughs> they are. They are. They are. They are. They are. They are. Chief counsel. <laughs> The other thing that I think is occurring in healthcare is that the guilds, from my perspective, <laughs> are dead. The guilds are dead. And uh, they haven't figured that out yet. But they're, they're beginning to figure it out. I had a really interesting discussion with the CEO of one of the large multi-specialty uh, organizations the other day, uh, or specialty organizations. And uh, we were talking about this issue, and, and he agreed that uh, you know, the guild is in trouble and they need to think differently about how they're going to work together with other like-minded <coughs> specialty organizations. We are moving from a non-integrated artisan type approach to healthcare to much more standardized, uh, meaningful reporting, and actually systems. Uh, you know, if you want to be pejorative about it, you know, the docs say, oh, you know, we're going to be corporatized. Well, I've, I've lived in the corporate world for the last 20 years. It's actually not a bad world. Uh, they can actually do good things in corporations. Uh, so the question, and you know, Kaiser, interesting organization, Kaiser on the West Coast attracts the creme de la creme of the residents every single year. They get the best residents. Why? Because they offer something that you can't get in private practice, which is stability. You get to practice medicine, you don't have to worry about the business side, and you work a regular life. And that's what a lot of people like that are physicians nowadays. So Kaiser is exploding. It's growing tremendously. And Kaiser-like organizations. I was just with uh, Glenn Steele, who's the CEO of Geisinger Clinic. Same issue. They're getting all the best residents coming into their organization. Their, their ability to attract is really quite high. Diagnostic diffusion is another one. So we're starting to implant devices in people. And uh, we're putting sensors into people. Uh, I'm involved with a, a very interesting company that uh, started off uh, uh, capturing information from RFID devices so they can track where all the equipment is and all the people are <coughs> in an institution. But they're now taking their platform, which is open, and they can actually capture the information from any type of RFID device with their software. They're now in the process of capturing all the data from all these devices as well. So they're writing their code so that they can be the platform uh, for capturing that information and then attaching it to the electronic health record. I think that's a very exciting and interesting idea because that data is going to help determine uh, how we're going to care for people. So, I don't know if I've got my example in here or not. Let me see. I don't have it in here. I took it out. Um, so, let me use the example uh, congestive heart failure. Uh, congestive heart failure, as we all know, uh, people start to go into congestive heart failure about 72 hours before they show up in the ER. Okay, and how do we know that? Well, they start to accumulate fluid. It's very easy to figure out if they're accumulating fluid. How do you do that? Well, in the morning when they get up, you have them step on a scale, you have them step off the scale, the data goes in immediately to a computer, the computer does an analysis and says, hey, Mrs. Jones, you've gained uh, 10 pounds overnight. Uh, get a phone call, maybe we should start you on a diuretic, we keep you out of the hospital. You know, that study was actually done. It was done at a major uh, institution up in a, in a city in the Northeast. I think it starts with a B. Um, <laughs> that, uh, and they showed very clearly that they could keep people out of the hospital. This is now eight years ago. What happened to that study? Well, they pulled the plug on it. Why? 
because people weren't showing up in the ER. Mm -hmm. They were losing revenue. Now, if you're an accountable care organization, are you going to implement that kind of a system? Absolutely. I think you need to explain what an ACO is for this crowd. What what? What an ACO is for this crowd. Oh, oh okay. Uh, ACO is an accountable care organization, which is a, a, a new business model that is being developed. I would say it is not absolutely clear exactly how it's going to be structured, but basically what it does is it says that we're going to give funds to an organization, and that organization, is, uh, some people liken it to capitation, but it's capitation on steroids, where we're going to give the funds to an organization and they're going to become accountable for the entire care of that individual or a group of individuals. And they're going to provide all of the services across the entire spectrum for that individual. And in return, if they do a good job, they get to keep the difference. And if they do a bad job, they lose money. So you become much more cognizant of where your resources are being expended. So. Uh, a lot of, you know, Kaiser, for all intents and purposes, is an ACO. If you want to look at an organization and say, well, well, what do they look like? Well, Kaiser is the example that's thrown up. But you get uh, organizations like Geisinger is clearly moving in this direction. But it's not just organizations like that. The uh, nephrologists through DeVita are creating a renal uh, accountable care organization. So those patients who had renal uh, transplants and have ongoing dialysis have p particular problems and they're, they're really cared for by a lot of nephrologists and internists. Well, you could create a system that would care for those kinds of individuals as well. So that's what we mean when we say ACO. It's a new business model that was part of the ACA, the Accountable Care Act that was passed, or what some people call Obamacare. Uh, so this was part of the legislation that was created, and with the uh, stamp of approval now with the Supreme Court, there's going to be an acceleration of organizations looking at developing these types of efforts. As a matter of fact, the number of conversations that are ongoing since the Supreme Court decision have just exploded. It's, it's really kind of so, so the model is not new. It's been there. I mean, it talked yep. about, like you mentioned. Yep. So what changed is, are there more incentives to drive towards that as a result of care? Yeah, so what so is different? What's different is that, uh, for example, Medicare is going to be putting its dollars in there. Okay. Well, if you take Medicare, which represents, what, 38% of the entire health care spend in this country, something like that, yeah. uh, you know, you, all of a sudden, the big gorilla is doing something a different way. Every time Medicare makes a significant change, the rest of the industry follows. Uh, you have the big health insurance companies who are recognizing that this is the direction that they're, that they're going. So they're already getting ready to do this. So Aetna, Cigna, United, Humana, they're all partnering up with healthcare systems to try to figure out how to deliver these services on a regional basis. Most of them are being done on a regional basis. But once you start to do it on a regional basis, I can, my projection is that 15 years down the road, that we're going to have some national <coughs> health care delivery systems. I, I'd be shocked if George Halverson, who's the CEO of Kaiser, isn't thinking about that. I mean, I'm really be shocked because I know he is. He has to be because of the amount of money that they're spending on the East Coast building infrastructure, capability, hiring physicians, developing services, etc. It's very clear to me that they've made that decision. But we can see Mayo go national. That'd be interesting. Mm -hmm. Geisinger's talking about it. Uh, the number of partnerships between Cleveland Clinic is, you know, they're going international. Why can't they do national? Oh, here's my CHF example. I'll switch over that. Um, oh, another one that I think is very interesting. Do you guys know Mike Roizen? Mike, Mike is the chief um, uh, innovation officer at the Cleveland Clinic. He's a physician. He's an anesthesiologist. But he got into healthy life about 20 years ago. And... <coughs> What he has shown is that they have what they call the five normals. And the five normals are normal weight, no smoking, normal glucose and, and hemoglobin A1C, normal cholesterol, and keep your vaccinations up to date. And then this is how they manage them. This is how they monitor those five things. And what they have shown is that if you manage them, those five normals, no. and you get your patients to normal, whoops, Okay. 
Resume Resume slide slideshow. Show. Resume slideshow. Center. Right there. So, um, what he shows is that um, the USA, if they did this, would save a billion dollars per year. Just, just on that one little activity. For the Medicare population, let alone the rest of the population. I mean, what's interesting about that is that sometimes in our healthcare world, we, we concentrate on the high-hanging fruit versus the stuff that's you know, sitting right in front of us. And in, in healthcare, I think one of the things that we need to start doing is paying attention to that low-hanging fruit because it's right there. And you know, a trillion dollars over 10 years, that's, that's, that's real money. I mean, that, that could make a difference. That could really help. And that's focusing on one kind of issue. So uh, peripheral intelligence. This is where uh, I wanted to quote Bob Hankel, who's my friend. This is a quote I was <coughs> trying to remember from memory. We don't even know how to use analytics in our healthcare system, and we don't even know which questions to ask. And he's the chief operating officer of the largest not-for-profit healthcare system in the country, $25 billion enterprise. And he's, he said that to me on Friday. Now that says something. That says that in the informatics world, where we know how to massage information, we know how to analyze it, we know how to extract knowledge, we know how to create knowledge, and intelligence from data that we haven't done a good job of educating the people that run the systems and spend the money. And one of the things that I believe is happening in the informatics field is that while we've done a really good job on the biomedical side, we have not done as good a job on the applied side. And the applied side is where we're going to see the action, I think, in the coming decade. And actually, we need to help support that. We need to educate people. We need to foster it. We need to engage in the analytics of this data. If we're going to all this trouble to spend $29 billion deploying electronic health records, we should surely get something out of it besides storing electronic health records. We should be able to create knowledge. And I think we have that opportunity. We have that opportunity. But it, it's going to rely upon the informatics community, from my perspective, to step up and say, here's how we should do that. You know, what kinds of standards do we need? And we need to be, become a little more articulate and a lot more assertive with our perspective on how this should be done. And I think it cuts across all of the informatics fields. It, it is really industry working with the academics, working with the applied side to try to bring this together so that we can help drive value in healthcare. Uh, so I think we have a very important role as we look to the future. And that's really what the new virtuality is, is really all about. So the implications for the healthcare system in general is that we are going to see consolidation. Effectiveness and efficiency are the watchwords of the day. And effectiveness and efficiency will be uncovered by informaticians, from my perspective. We're going to see globalization of care. We're going to see virtualization of care. We're going to see accountable care, as I described it, or in some other fashion, but we are going to be, we're not going to be passing it to getting the patient anymore, or getting the payment anymore. That era is coming to a close. The fee-for-service system, from my perspective, is not going to work except for very specialized, very, um, well, unique knowledge things. We'll still have it there. Productivity is important. Again, how do we manage productivity? Well, again, informaticians are very important in looking at the data to figure out what is the most productive approach to delivering care. What, where, is, where are the problems in the delivery of services? What are the bottlenecks? Uh, and then information exchange and data analytics, as I've already pointed out. Uh, now, I, I wanted to share with you at least my thoughts as a non-pharmaceutical uh, industry person, what my perspective was on what this means for pharma. So on the train, on the way over here, I sat down and brainstormed with myself, and I talked to Jonathan, and I said, you know, here's my thoughts. What do you think? So I'm going to share them with you, which is that I think that we are moving towards a period where discovery will include clinical information in real time. Now, how are we going to do that? Well, I was fascinated to learn about a project that Steve is working on where you're creating a collaborative knowledge base. Uh, and I think that has the potential for accomplishing something like this. But I think in the next 10 years, that's the direction that we're going to be moving in. 
which means that as you think about your research, uh, your foundational research and how that extends, it's going to become uh, a different kind of an approach towards knowledge uh, uncovery. Um, clinical decision support clearly is going to be moving from retrospective uh, to concurrent. I think that what's interesting about the healthcare industry in general is that the life sciences communities have more resources at their disposal in terms of technology and infrastructure to accomplish analytics than the healthcare delivery systems. Healthcare delivery systems are way behind life sciences in terms of capability. Uh, I could go to Ascension and I couldn't get this many people in a room to talk about informatics. I mean, there's just, they don't exist. So they're going to be doing a catch up to what you are. Now, at the same time, uh, and, and I, I guess what I would suggest is that if you agree with the notion that you, we're going to be capturing real-time clinical information in the future and that's going to become part of the data pool, having those kind of resources out in the systems is going to become an important part of how you do your work. So we need to think that through and what that means. Um, and I think informatics as a profession is moving from an interest to really a capability. We have done that through the fact that uh, Amy and now we have the subspecialty designation for informatics. It's the first time that that has been accomplished. We are now the 26th specialty within medicine. We are in the process of putting together the board certification process. Um, so it will be a subspecialty under the American Board of Preventive Medicine. Uh, and so we're working on that, and it's kind of exciting to be a part of that. But that means that it's no longer just an interest among clinicians and researchers and the like. It is now becoming a capability, and we're going to have accreditation standards and all of, all of that. So that's really changing the field of informatics. Uh, I liken it to, you know, when I went into family medicine, I was at the very first wave of family medicine people to go through residency. Prior to that, it was all on-the-job training. You know, you sort of grandfathered in. Well, all of us will be grandfathered in as informaticians. In the future, we're, we're going to be having... <laughs> well, some of us are grandfathered in. Um, and then, you know, value is going to become a, a, like a, a real key criteria for accountable care organizations. So they're going to be looking uh, for knowledge that can help drive value. And I think they're going to become much more discerning around how they spend their resources. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, the interface that they create as these organizations come together and how they're going to interact with the pharmaceutical industry because you're going to have to demonstrate value for the drugs and other uh, medications that you create and uh, you know, bring to uh, the system. And then finally, <clears throat> I do believe that we're going to have the capability of creating cross-institutional DNFI databases for clinical research. That's already being discussed. The example that I shared with Steve is uh, last Friday, I met with the CEO of the American Society of Clinical Oncologists. And they want to create a database of uh, oncology information that they can share real time with oncologists in the field so that the oncologists can, do, can engage in the right protocol at the right time. That's not being done today. It's being done locally. They think that by doing it nationally that they can actually help accelerate the adoption of certain protocols because, quite frankly, a lot of oncologists sort of cruise along and they don't use the latest protocols. And we all know that. So that's some of my thoughts. Uh, you know, I believe that uh, from my perspective it's really important to embrace the future. And uh, so, you know, my perspective is I keep trying to encourage my colleagues to take their head out of the sand and recognize that we've got a lot of change going on around us rather than resist it, try to build brick walls, try to plant trees to create tsunamis so they won't affect us. Rather than that, I think we need to learn how to surf tsunamis. So I'm encouraging every, all my executive colleagues to get surfboard. Um, and, you know, we can go out and try to find Elvis or we can look in the mirror. And so every morning when I get up, I have a little sign actually on my mirror that says, what are you going to do to solve problems today? You know? So I, I really do have that pasted on my mirror. Because I think it is important for us to look at ourselves. We know what to do in healthcare. It is absolutely clear to me that we have the answers. When I sit down and talk with, I could have a one-on-one -on -one with all of you, we could come up with four or five ideas like tomorrow. 
that we could implement that would make healthcare better. So I think we need to get out there and try to do it. So that's my thoughts. Oh, the other thing I would say, and what I tell my colleagues, particularly in the healthcare delivery side, is that they need to paddle like hell. So, <laughs> so with that, uh, I think we got a little time for a Q and A.